Everybody, uh, what did Ricky Ricardo always say? Excuses. You've got so many excuses not to go to church right now. Why are you here? You've got the excuse of COVID. You've got the excuse of, well, you've worked really hard all week. You've got excuses, excuses. You could be at home sleeping right now. You could say, well, I'm tired. I yawned once, so my body needs more sleep. I better lay out. What's that? Yeah, that's a sniffle. I better stay home. Why did you, why did you risk life and limb to be here today? Why, why don't you just stay home with all the rest of the perfect people in the world? Why are you like this? Church life, it doesn't make any sense. Why are you so committed to church life? You have so many reasons that you don't have to go. I mean, does, we know from the Bible, does God, God doesn't really expect us to go every Sunday. I mean, you got Easter and Christmas. Or, or does he? So why are we so committed to church life? And this, here is one path, just one passage that I'm really excited about, so I hope you'll get excited about it too, but it's 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5. And here's, I'm just going to split these two verses up and just give two, two points and then kind of summarize them into one idea, okay? Here's the first one. We believe so much in church life because we consider Jesus the living stone. That's, I'll explain what I mean by that as we go. But would you say this with me? We consider Jesus the living stone. Now I'm going to talk about a foundation. Okay, so foundation is something that you need before you build a building, a house, or something important structure. So we consider Jesus the living stone. He's the living stone, the foundation stone, the chief cornerstone of the most important building in the cosmos. So this goes beyond, why do you go to church? Well, I like the feeling I get. This goes beyond that, right everybody? Why do you go to church? Well, I really like singing with other people. Well, that makes me feel good. This goes way beyond that. We believe in church because Jesus is the foundation stone of the most important building in the cosmos. And I want to be a part of that. Verse 4, coming to him, or a the grammar is kind of tough here. Coming to him or approaching him. And I'm going to use this word. Considering him. You come to Jesus as. You consider him to be a living stone. Everybody, can you follow that illustration so far? A stone that's alive. Okay, we follow you. Okay, Peter, hanging in there with you. Go ahead. Rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. So we're going to come to Jesus as this living stone. Consider him the living stone. Singular. Because notice in verse 5 that he's going to talk about living stones. Plural. Somebody say, that's me. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm one of those stones. Yep. I'm a brick. I'm a little hard-headed. Sometimes. I'm one of those stones. Plural. But Jesus is a living stone, singular. That's why I'm calling him the living stone. We consider him that. Who was on the one hand rejected by men, but on the other hand chosen and precious to God. How could that be? How could it be that one person could either be so loved or so rejected? Right, we'll talk about that more in just a minute. Read with me in verse 6. Therefore, it is also contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion. He's quoting the Old Testament now. I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect. He's chosen. He's precious. And he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Somebody say, I believe on him. Somebody say, I believe him. You will by no means be put to shame this chief cornerstone cornerstone. I lay in Zion, chief cornerstone, chosen, precious to God, rejected by men. Now what's exciting about this is that Je the whole idea here is that Jesus is the chief part, the most important part of a foundation. And so in order to get excited about Peter's illustration, you need to get kind of excited about foundations. How many of you get excited about foundations? 
you got your work cut out for you, Drew. There is a person in this room who, when he sees a foundation, he gets excited about it. And he's going to tell you his testimony about foundations. And by the time he's done, they're going to get excited about them too, aren't they, Drew? I would hope so. <laughs> they they better. Everybody, please give 100% of your attention to Mr. Drew Brady. <laughs> Okay, I just wanted to share that we are, I, I like all, all things construction, I, I know most of you know that, but we are pretty privileged that in our backyard, right in our own grass that we used to mow, <laughs> is now a subdivision, and they're building it every day. So we get to, I get to, okay, I get, I say we, but I get to walk back there and you get to look around, you get to see it, you get to watch those big excavators working and loaders and all, and I walk back there and you see these mounds of shale coming up. It's all shale back there. It's actually pretty hard. But that's what's exciting. You get to see all the way they're doing this from the beginning to the end. And you go back here, and you get to look down in them trenches, and you see this shale, this hard rock, and you know. You know for sure then these houses are going to be built on a nice, solid foundation. You just know that. And that's what's pretty cool about it. You get to see it from the very beginning. I already know every one of them houses are going to be built on a solid foundation there. Nice shale. They're going to be good at homes. And I like to see that. So that's just my point of view. That's great. Come on. Right. Never look at a foundation the same way again. Now, when people like Drew walk up to the foundation, they can look at it. I look at a foundation, I go, oh, look, a foundation. Somebody's going to build something on top of that. And Drew can look at it like some of you guys can and say, well, there's, yeah, they're going to build something and evidently they're going to have this, they're going to have this, they're going to have this, because I can tell by the foundation that they've laid and where everything's laid out. Now, how many of you are like Drew? You get excited about foundations. Did it work? Let's see. Raise your hand. I get excited about foundations too. Okay. Let me ask the question this way. Uh, Nathan, maybe this will help the other folks. They're building a house near your house. Nobody ever goes over and snoops at it before it's finished? Okay. All right, sometimes, and this, that smell of new, new construction. Okay, so you get the idea. Excited about a foundation. You walk out and find a foundation that has been laid that you did not see before. And it's, it's big. And it's rock solid. And it's impressive. And it's going to be strong. And that's it? Is it always just going to be a foundation? What's going to happen soon? That work was hard work, right? To get the foundation laid, everyone. And now the work can go a lot faster. And would whatever happens next is going to be something impressive. We know that because we can tell by the foundation. So when we come upon a foundation that has already been laid and it's rock solid, we find out that that foundation is something for us. We can get excited about it, can't we? That this now is the future. Something is coming. Something is going to be built atop this that's going to be amazing. And someone said the most important building in the cosmos. We consider Jesus the living stone, that foundation stone, and that's one of the reasons why we believe so much in church life. So I still don't follow you, Pastor Trey. Well, hold on for just a second. We need to talk more about verse 4, because in verse 4 we find out that on the one hand, Jesus, this living stone, this foundation, is rejected indeed by men. There are plenty of people who walk right by it every day who could care less about Jesus, the foundation stone. But on the other hand, God himself has considered this foundation to be the most important foundation in the universe. Chosen and precious. How is it possible, come on, that some people could walk right by Jesus and care nothing for him while other people see him, seize him, and would sell their very lives to get him. Help me out with that, everybody. 
How is that possible? Sorry? They don't see the end product. They don't fully believe. They don't appreciate the value. So we do this all the time. How many of you love thrifting? <laughs> How many of you can find treasures and precious gems at a yard sale? Pre treasures and precious gems among junk. One man's trash, right? Now, if you can do that, then maybe this illustrates how this happens. A lot of people walk right on by Jesus and this foundation could care nothing about it other than stay away so they don't accidentally fall in. But then there are other people who see him in the midst of all these other items and says, this is the pearl of great price. This is the treasure hidden in the field. This is what I've always looked for my whole life. I would give my soul for this. So I wanted Michelle Brady to complete the whole package deal here and to come up here for just a moment to the microphone of destiny and explain to us this whole idea about you go into, you're shopping somehow and you see a treasure whereas I just walked past it and didn't see any value in it at all. This was hard for me because I have lots of treasures <laughs> that are used things in my home. But this is a very special treasure I have. And this is from either a yard sale or a, the hospice center, I'm not sure. But you have to be willing to dig and rummage a little bit to find a treasure. So this is a very special treasure, and I've shared it with some people before, Ella. Inside of it, when I opened it, it's some um, cake decorating items that I always thought I'd like to do. It had tips and knives and a ruler and the thing to cut the cake on top and everything. And it, it, to me, it's a treasure. I'm willing to share it with somebody, but I'll have this forever. You ready for it? Because I'm not very good at taking pictures of my creations, but I like to create cakes. And there's two that I could find. And to me, it brings me joy and pleasure to just be creative. And I didn't have to go to Michael's and spend tons and tons of money. I think this was $3. So I had to be willing to look open it up and look inside and it's a treasure to me but somebody else just thought it was junk and donated it Good job. hey thank you <laughs> verse 7 therefore to you who believe he is precious but to those who are disobedient to him and to them in verse 8 Jesus is just a stumbling stone they just stumble over him He's not a foundation of something immense and awesome. He's just a rock in the way. Somebody explain that to me. There are those who walk past Jesus and the message of Jesus that you give and others give every single day and could care less. And then there are those who will suffer and die before ever renouncing the name of Jesus. There are those, like my sweet wife, who will believe on him without wavering, even when tumors are growing in her stomach and poisoning her entire body. Even then, she will love him more, and he will be even more precious to her in that moment. Somebody explain that to me. How is Jesus that much of a polarizer? You come to him, and he doesn't let you take the middle ground. Either he is everything to you, or just go home. You ever seen that before? It's almost unfair, but that is what he does. This is the gospel. It's for people who get it. And Jesus, for the people who get it, Jesus is the chief cornerstone of the most amazing, most important building in the universe. But for those who don't get it, he's just a rock. You might fall over it, kick it out of the way, right? So the first reason why we believe so much in church life is this, is because we consider Jesus the living stone. So well, I understand that, and a lot of people understand that, don't, don't even go to church, Trey. Why is that important? Because of this next point, and this comes from verse 5. 
Verse 5 says, you also. In other words, in verse 4, coming to him, as to a living stone. Verse 5, here's the grammar. And you also coming to yourselves, approaching yourselves. So consider Jesus a living stone and consider yourselves, what? Living stones. That's the grammar here. So in verse 4, Peter is saying to do this right, to understand this, to get this, this is what you need to do. You need to consider Jesus to be the stone, the foundation stone. And you need to consider yourselves as little living stones. And where are you going to put those little living stones, everybody? On top of the foundation. Now everybody say, ah, it's starting to come together now. It's starting to come together now. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now I want to unpack that for just a second. But Peter is talking about the church, the people of God, both Jew and Gentile, who have put their faith in Jesus. This is the church, God's people in the New Testament. There isn't another group. There isn't the church, and then there was the people of God over there, and the people of God over there. Everyone, there is just the church. Would you say the church? church. This is the building. So are you following the metaphor? Can we picture ourselves as the building? As rocks? Somebody say, come on. I'm a rock. I want to to, to fill on that for just a second, okay? This is an expression that I've used, and uh, I've been slightly misquoted, so I want to get this correct here. (laughs) <laughs> we are not fluffs of cotton candy glued together by syrup to form the church of the fluffy pink spiritual wimp. We are stones, hard, coarse, We are not the beautiful, sentimental people of the Hallmark Christianity Church where everything works out perfectly in the end. We are stones, hard, coarse, and built to last. We are not the gold bars that form the building of the prosperity gospel where Jesus died to make you healthy and happy and wealthy. That's not who we are. We are stones. We are coarse. We are rough. We are not made to be pretty. We are made to last and weather all storms. That is who we are. Would you say living stones? We, Peter says to do this, you need to consider Jesus the living stone and you need to see yourselves as little stones built atop Jesus as the foundation stone, right? He says in verse 5, you also as living stones are being built up. You're being built up. In other words, you're being built together with other living stones. So in other words, Yes, we're rocks, we're stones, we're bricks that go in this building. And by, by, by myself or alone, we are not much. But build us into a building, and what do we become, according to this verse? A spiritual house. Now we know this from this text as well as others, but whose house are we talking about? This is the house of the living God. He lives in his people who are built together to form a house. In this world, the house of God is made of people. Bricks, stones, who are built together atop Jesus. And when we are built together by our love in the Holy Spirit by our common faith and common baptism and common allegiance to our king, when we're built up by those things, 
then we become this structure that is more immense and amazing than any other structure on the planet. And that's why I say now this is becoming the most amazing building in the universe because this is the one place where God lives on earth in His church. Living stones built together atop the foundation stone. We consider ourselves living stones. We consider Jesus the living stone. This is us, everybody. This is an... You, well, you, if you're listening, you can... No, you can't see this. This is an image of... This is an image of bricks piled up together. They fit together pretty well. And at the bottom is this foundation stone. This is Jesus, the cornerstone foundation. And then each of these bricks has a last name of a church family member on it. And I see Goodwin, Trench, Ivy, Musto, Hensley, Hammonds, Rittenauer, Hamilton, Roberts, Plasters, and they're all up there. And they all see themselves as stones built together for a house where the Almighty lives. Somebody say, why do you believe so much in church life, Pastor Trey? Why have you been here 16 years, Pastor Trey? Why is it you plan to die doing this, Pastor Trey? Why is it you guys go to church every single week? Why is it that you invest so many resources and so much time and energy into the relationships at church? Why do you do that? Just because it feels nice? Just because daddy told me to do it and mama said I have to? Why, why do you do that? I do that because I'm being built together on this foundation that's Jesus with these other believers. And this is the spot. This is the place where God lives on earth. And that's kind of big. Right, everyone? That's kind of big. We are being, being built up together, a spiritual house, and check this out, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Do you hear that? What's happening in this house? Holy worship. Every single person is a priest giving God the worship that's due. And somebody's looking at our world going, everyone has lost their minds where can I go where it is very clear that God is firmly ensconced on his throne? Where can I go? And the answer is, go to his house. Go to where his people are. And look at these other people who have given their allegiance to the king, and they've been built together. And in this house, what will you find them doing in this house, everyone? And I, Once again, you know I'm not talking about this building. I love our building. But we'd have this house if we were out there in the field, wouldn't we, everyone? If we were meeting in your basement, wouldn't we, everyone? Right? It would still be that house. It would still be the congregation. And what would you find if you went in there and say, oh, this world's going nuts. i got to go someplace. And I go to that house, and what do I find there? I find people giving honor and adoration and worship to the king of the universe. And I say, ah, these are my people. And all is right with the world. Verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness, remember those days, and into his marvelous light, who once were not a people. There, you were just a brick, a rock in the middle of the field, had no meaning whatsoever, and he adopted you into his family and built you into his house. And now you're a people. There was a time when you did not have mercy. When we are born, we're born, our default position is as an enemy of the living God. But now we have obtained mercy. Before we didn't have mercy, now we have mercy. And so in other words, Father God is saying, His Spirit in this passage is saying, People of God, you are a noble people. You are rock, stones built on the foundation of the most important, amazing building in the cosmos. And it's called the church. And that's kind of exciting. And that's why we do what we do every single week, isn't it, everyone? All the investments that we make here. But notice this as we close. In the last part of verse 5. What makes all this happen? He says there's, it's a spiritual house. There are these priests inside giving holy worship to God. They're offering up the spiritual sacrifices of things like thanksgiving and praise and testimony and they're doing it they're giving this to God through help me out through Jesus Christ 
there is one thing that makes all of this possible. There's one thing that took me out of that field and built me into this house. There's one thing that took me from a place of being an enemy of God to now being uh, his child who has obtained mercy. And what is that thing? I have this relationship with God, let's say it together, through Jesus Christ. It, everything is about what I do with Jesus. He has offered me salvation. He is ready to receive me with open arms. He says, Trey, repent of your sins and come to me and I will take you and I will wash your sins away. I'll introduce you to my papa and he'll adopt you into his family. And then my wild and bold spirit will come live inside of you and you will be built together with those other spirit-filled bricks to make the church, to make the building in this lifetime. Why do we believe so much in church life? Because we consider Jesus the living stone, and we consider ourselves living stones. Built atop the most amazing building in the cosmos. And then look through the New Testament. There is just not something else. That is what it is. So I want to close by just taking all that and putting it into one thing. We are, we are distinguished by church life because it is a part of who we are. Will you guys say this with me? We are distinguished by our church life because church is a part of who we are. One more time. We are distinguished by our church life because church is a part of who we are. Now I want to just give one last illustration and then we'll close things up. I'm going to ask Michelle if she'd come on up and we'll get ready to sing our song of invitation. But imagine you are trying to go into the grocery store to buy food that your family needs. And, and there's people there to stop you, armed people for some reason. You say, well, can I go in? And they say, of course you can go in. And you start to go in and they stop you. You say, well, what are you doing? And they say, well, you can't go in with that right arm. I said, well, what are you talking about? Well, you, you can come in here all you want. <laughs> you just can't come in with that right arm. But my right arm is a part of me. Like, huh, sorry, then you can't come in. How many of you heard that this year? You can have church all you want, but you've got to have it this way. Or how many of you say, well, can't you just be a Christian without even going to church? Right? Why is that even important? We've just spent this time realizing that my new identity in Christ is intertwined with the church. The church is a part of who I am. You cannot separate me from my beliefs. I mean, I believe like I do, but this is the way I believe. This is what I think Scripture teaches. Is that who you are? It's what the Bible says God's church is. Is that who you are? We want to see our unchurched family members become those stones in this building. People of God, let's spend a time right now just praying. Father God, is this where I am? Do I belong to you? Do I see myself and Jesus the way you do? Or have I been ignoring the most important things in life? Father God, do I even belong to you? Let's ask those questions in prayer right now and let him search our hearts.